Um, my, my name is Richard Sadler. Um, I'm organising for North Yorkshire for Europe. Um, um, I'm a relative newcomer to this uh, Remain campaign. We only formed about six or seven months ago, but we've tried to do as much as we can in a short time to play catch up. And yesterday we were uh, at Leyburn um, Auction Mart um, getting our feet muddy with uh, wellies with uh, farmers because we thought that was a good, uh, a good market to target as an example of some of the people that will be negatively affected by Brexit. And we sort of pitched the question to get the answer we wanted. Are you worried about the way things are going? And surprise, surprise, most farmers were very worried. Um, and so we got some good uh, media interests with that. Um, but we're, we're kind of paying catch up. But I think we are an example of how Groups are springing up all over the place, all over the country, new pro-Remain groups, this fantastic grassroots movement that is building around the country, building momentum, building strength. Um, and I think, um, you know, with, with so many groups now um, and so much activism, uh, we've noticed, even in that short time that I've been involved, we've done about 10 um, different events at street stores around North Yorkshire, uh, we've noticed how the, the tone and general attitudes of people that we interact with has changed. And people are questioning now, what, why, why are we doing this? Uh, and and uh, <coughs> leave, leave voters, or some of them are actually admitting, yeah, maybe we got it wrong. Um, but that, today's session then, uh, or this session I should say, um, is about um, remaking the case for Europe. What can we learn from past mistakes? What, what can we could do? What can we do um, to make that case for Europe? And so we've got some excellent speakers here um, who will know far more about this than me. So I'm going to um, ask first of all um, Richard Corbett, um, MEP for Yorkshire and the Humber, um, to put some of your thoughts uh, across, Richard, as to what what we need to get across. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it's great to see such a good turnout. This battle is not over. We're here not to give up, but to win it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the title given to this session, How Can the Disparate <coughs> Remain Groups Work Effectively Together? I'm not worried that there are disparate groups. I think that is a richness. Everyone is coming to this bringing something special, bringing something different. I'm, apart from being leader of the Labour MEPs in the European Parliament, I'm vice chair of the European Movement, a cross-party organisation with individual members, branches across the country that's been there for many years, sees itself as a grassroots pro-European organisation. There are the organisations, Open Britain and others, which were set up during or after the referendum campaign as, a, as an organisation with marketing, with money, with advertising skills and so on. There are niche organisations like Scientists for Europe that have come from their own particular skills and viewpoints. Niche, niche, well, niche, <laughs> niche in the very positive sense of the word, of course. But they've all, they're all bringing different things. All, uh, the key thing is they're not clashing. There, there were jokes a few months ago about the People's Judean Liberation Front and the Liberation Front of the People's <laughs> Judea. No, it's not like that. There is there's a lot of, uh, should we say, harmony breaking out. And that is a good <coughs> thing. It was also natural that there were different strategies. That the, straight after the referendum, it was natural that some felt it was appropriate, because that was all that they thought was possible, to go for the softest form of Brexit. While, whereas others immediately said, no, this, this is a disaster for our country. We've got to campaign to stop it. This referendum, it was an advisory referendum, one on the basis of a pack of lies by a narrow majority with a questionable franchise. Why should we give in any more than we give up our everything we believe in if we happen to lose a general election? No, you fight on. It was natural there were different views. But now... As we approach the reality of an emerging Brexit that looks certain to be a damaging, costly Brexit, harming our country, destroying jobs, threatening our rights, 
hurting the public finances and therefore our public services, of course everybody is reaching the same conclusion. We need to find a way of stopping disaster for our country. And the way to do that is to oppose the costly damaging deal and a good way to do it as well is to ask for a public vote on it. Why should the public not have the right to reconsider? Why, as I mean, David Davis himself, if you remember him, yeah. <laughs> he said if a democracy cannot change its mind, it ceases to be a democracy. Well, that's the one thing he ever said that I agree with. <laughs> And it's quite telling that those people who now say it's the will of the people, we cannot change our minds, we cannot reconsider, we have to deliver Brexit because it's the will of the people, they're the very same people who don't want to check whether it still is the will of the people. They don't want the people to have the chance to express themselves again because they know that public opinion <coughs> is shifting. Public opinion, by the way, People say, well, it's only shifted X percent since the referendum, and that's not yet enough. The true comparator is to what you would have expected public opinion to do after the referendum. You would have expected many people to, well, however they'd voted, to rally behind the results. People would say, well, we, we've had our debates. We, we've voted. It's, it's settled. Let's get on with it. You would have expected 60% plus to be backing Brexit. That's not happened. It's gone the other way, and it's been going steadily the other way, and according to the latest polling, quite significantly the other way. And that, I think, is a good democratic argument that everybody can use, is to say people have the right to take a decision, because the Brexit that's emerging bears no resemblance whatsoever to what was promised by the Leave campaign, or indeed by Brexit ministers. They said it would be easy, it's difficult. They said it would save lots of money that would all go to the NHS, it's going to be a costly exercise. They said there'd be shiny new trade deals with countries across the world ready on day one to replace any lost trade with the European Union. We're actually losing the deals that we, the countless deals that we currently have with countries across the world via the European Union and having to go backwards on international trade. Every single promise they made is turning, turning to, to dust. And that's why Leave voters, and we've got to address them, Leave voters have every right to say, that's not what we were told, that's not what I voted for, I want a chance to vote again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and so um, our next speaker is uh, Louise Todd, who is, uh, I'm sure you all know by now, a Chief Executive Officer for Best for Britain, um, has, has done a, an awful lot to uh, improve with you know, brilliant campaign work, uh, the profile of the, the Remain movement. Um, and so uh, I did speak to Eloise very briefly before this, and she, she was making the point that, uh, yes, you know, the title of this uh, session is How Can the Disparate Remain Groups Work Effectively Together? Um, I'm sorry if I got the title wrong just now, by the way. So, so that's what this is about. Um, uh, but, of course, we can't um, all unite as one organisation because that would be illegal. Um, and so, a uh, in, 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 a, in a referendum, but you, uh, she, you, Eloise is going to explain more about that. Um, um, I think it's it's about how uh, disparate groups can can work together, uh, and and we can celebrate our, all the, the different co contributions or work together to to, to be more effective um, in that way. Um, yeah. So o over to you, Eloise. Thank you, and thanks very much for the invitation. This is it, the most unbelievable event I've been to in my year and a half. The rooms are packed, everyone's enthusiastic. It's absolutely brilliant, and I think it does reflect the shifting mood of the country. Um, I lead Best for Britain. We are politically independent. We work in a cross-party way, and what we try to do is work for one thing and one thing alone. We exist to try and stop Brexit democratically. We're not interested in mitigating. We think soft Brexit would be very damaging, and we think that we have to try and stop Brexit while these negotiations are going on. So in that sense, our mission is extremely clear. We think the best way to do that is via a people's vote, and we're proud to be part of that movement. What we try to do is push very hard to get MPs on the record 
to support a people's vote with an option to stay in. We need to start normalising more and more the idea that it's okay to talk about staying in the EU. All right, it's not perfect, but we know things that we can do to either reform it, and frankly, the kind of conversations we had in the other room this morning, what do we need to do in our country? What, what are the kind of things that we need from our politicians to address some of the problems that actually led a lot of people in leave areas? Some of them don't like the EU, absolutely. It's not that that needs to be acknowledged. But a lot of people were kicking back against a lot of different things, and we can't just talk about a stay in agenda. We have to change Britain, and yeah. we have to reform yeah. the EU. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's what we, we need to work with the politicians on that front. We're not a political party. We've got no interest in being one. We just want to stop Brexit. I just want to share with you a few of the things that we try and do. We also try and support the movement. We give more than a quarter of our own money away. We invest in some of the groups that are here today. Um, we try to give small grants to really great initiatives around the country. Uh, and that's a really important part of what we do, to try and invest in the movement. It's not all about us. It's about whoever's got the best projects and strategies to win. Um, in terms of what we do, we're very research-led and data-led. We're geeks, to be quite honest with you. But the, the geeky stuff then informs our more creative campaigns. And one of the pieces of work that we did most recently was published in The Observer on the 12th of August, uh, our Brexit shift report. And this is the most extensive look at the constituency by constitu constituency shift since 2016. And now over half of constituencies can now call themselves Remain constituencies. And that is an unbelievably important thing, not only for the people of the country to know, and this is based on the 53-47 divide in the country, which, as Richard mentioned, you know, that's already probably been surpassed. So this is probably quite a shy estimate of where constituencies are, and we need to update that. But it's really important that people in the country understand that other people are taking a different view on Brexit, because it allows them to think differently too. And one of the things that we've found when we've gone around the country, as we've talked to people in all corners, especially leave voters that we try to talk to the most, soft leavers we call them, not the ones that will never change their mind, not when you've got that kind of cab driver that's really just going for it and you're like, okay, I'm just going to not mention what I do. I'm going <laughs> to try and not lie. I'm just going to say campaigns and hope that Brexit doesn't come up. Um, but what we found is... Most people say to us, oh, well, yeah, it'd be good, you know, it'd be good to stop it, maybe, but we can't, can we? It's not possible. Or they say something else. Well, we've left already, haven't we? Or they say, we can't get back in, as if we definitely have gone, and we won't get back the benefits that we've had. So the, we launched a campaign this week based on a massive, giant red button that says stop on it. Not very subtle. But what we, what we decided is that actually people need to know that it is possible to stop Brexit. And so we've got messaging like Brexit, we don't have to do this. And so we're not telling people what to think, we're just letting them know. And I think one of the biggest lessons we've learned is we absolutely can't preach. It's not about the great facts we know about the EU. We just need to let people know that if they are having thoughts about it, there are places they can get information, but it's not inevitable, and they can change their minds if they want. And so I think as campaigners, and the role that you play, which is absolutely vital, by all means, engage in those persuasion conversations, engage and tell people what you know, but listen more and just point out that it's not inevitable. And if the biggest message you deliver to people around you is... Brexit is not inevitable, we don't have to do it if we don't want to, then that is a massive victory. So don't think to yourself, oh God, unless I convert this person completely and have them sort of singing the European hymn by the end of the afternoon, <laughs> then I've not done a very good job. All you have to do is tell people at this stage that it's not inevitable and they should think about what they think is best for Britain. And that's why we're called what we're called, because we just simply think that the choice should be there for everybody and at the end of the day, we all need to do what's best for Britain. If the Prime Minister came back with a blinding deal that more or less did everything that we've, we have now in the EU with sovereignty, with decision-making power, with vetoes and all that, well, blimey, you know, we'd all have to look at it and go, well, do we accept that? We know it's not possible. Mm -hmm. But people, that is becoming clearer and clearer to people. So thank you for what you do. 
We are proud to be part of this movement. We're also proud to support different brands, different organisations, different groups of people, OFUC that can speak to young people. We're proud to support uh, labour groups that can do a really good job at trying to drive uh, labour motions through at the conference. We're proud to support different people that are much better placed than ours, potentially, to do and connect with the people they need to connect with. So this movement is rich in its diversity, as Richard said, as long as we're always all fighting towards the same goal, and that is to stay in the EU, get the option to remain on the table, and stay in before we leave this negotiating period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eloise. And could I just echo what you said about um, getting that message across that um, we, we're not necessarily leaving and that it, it isn't over, because some people still don't seem to get that. And uh, you know, it reminds me of a conversation I had with a Polish uh, waiter the other day um, who's having to apply for uh, British citizenship. And, uh, and when I said, uh, well, actually, no, it, 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 we're not necessarily leaving, she said, look, really? Really? And, 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 and people... Still, some people still don't get that, and so, yeah, I would certainly uh, echo that message. Um, our next speaker, I, I, I'm sure you all know him well, Dr. Mike Goldsworthy, for, for his uh, the, the sterling work that he seems to be everywhere on social media. He seems to <laughs> tirelessly producing videos, um, uh, eloquently expounding the cause uh, um, from a scientist's point of view. He's founder of Scientists for the EU and Healthier in. Um, we're very lucky to have you as a speaker um, as well, um, and very interested to hear what you have to say, Mike. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Yes, I do run two campaigns and have been doing for three and a half years now. I am knackered, but <laughs> I am also constantly enthused by the community that we've built and the energy that we've got here and all the people around me and around us, which I think... Um, is a vital part of what we're doing. It's just that community spirit. And I'm going to echo now a lot of what you heard from, from Richard and Eloise, um, apart from the cabbie thing, because I've had lots of good experiences with cabbies on this front, actually. Um, and I, I think with all people, yeah, there are some people who, who were dug in, but there are a lot of people, once they've run out of their own chat, then they start thinking, I wonder what they think. And they ask you, and because you've listened to them, they're quite open to that. I want to, I want to start with two stories um, that get at what I ultimately want to get at. The first one was back in summer 2016, before the vote. I'd just done a sort of debate forum with, um, on the subject of science with, with Jamie Martin, who was representing Vote Leave and had no scientific background. He was Michael Gove's little sort of helper and appointee that had been there to put in to help out scientists for Britain sort of jazz up their game. Anyway, um, he was telling me on the train on, on the way back, um, because we got on quite well, that Vote Leave strategy, even before they thought they were going to get Boris Johnson on board, was always about community, to find the communities that believed in their cause and then make sure that everyone in that community was burning about it and roping in all their friends and hauling them along to the, um, to the booths to vote on the day, um, even before they had any big players in there. The second story I want to tell you is in July 2017, when I was at an event like this in uh, Bristol, there's a lever, Pete North, who came along and he wrote a little blog on behind enemy lines because he wanted to see what we were all going to say. Um, and, he, and he told me um, at the end, right, well, there's a lot of people turned out for in-depth discussion. There's a lot of mobilization. If this is how it builds up and if there's another <coughs> referendum, leave have got nothing like this, we could be quite screwed. And so... I think it's dead important here that we realise that one of our assets that we did not have during the referendum, which we really have now, is that regional, in particular, granularity. Those communities that have been built up, those communities that can be fired up, those communities that work at the coalface day in, day out. That is a real asset that we have at the moment and where the, the Leave campaign, as it were, has somewhat left the battlefield and is sort of realising it now is Nigel Farage is getting agitated, jumping in with Leave Means Leave and trying to have 
um, rallies in Bolton because they can't put together another Brexit plan, so they're just going to do some more protesting and trying to turn people out. So um, over the last three and a half years that I've been campaigning with, with these two campaigns that we've set up, I've seen different structures of, of how we operate from the complete top-down asphyxiating nature of um, Britain's Stronger in Europe campaign to the completely fractured, scattered to the, the different winds that was immediately afterwards. From that, you realise two things. When you have the big campaigns um, prominently, then you do get media cut through at the top. It takes a bit of pushing, but then you've got people that, that, that come there and sit there and they're always called into the media studios and the, the, some of the right questions are always brought up. However, if you have that only, then you completely miss all the diversity of, of structures, whether it be niches uh, by sector or whether it be niches by regions that really understand the local regional dynamics and can work on their MPs there, which is I'm going to describe in a bit, is absolutely key. You need the both. And the way I think you need the both is as follows, and that is big campaigns support little campaigns and give them juice while we can before any, any um, referendum actually comes along and you can't have money sharing, you can't have data sharing and that kind of stuff. But at the moment, we need big campaigns to really set up all of those little campaigns to have their spokespeople, to have their data gathering capacity, to have their flyers, to really, really be empowered. You cannot have it so that all the little campaigns are beholden to the big campaign and just promote their messages and just feed all their data and crowdfunding and money upwards because then that starts asphyxiating the playing field. Um, so through time, um, I have seen those dynamics. So when Britain Stronger in Europe started up, it really crushed out a lot of small grassroots campaigns that I was trying hard to support. They wouldn't even list them on their website. That's why it felt so hollow community-wise. But then after the referendum, it felt rich in communities, but, but angry and uncoordinated. And what we found over time was that it didn't take a board of people or, or it didn't take uh, managerial sort of <coughs> structure. It just took co-working, organic co-working, until people started to get to know each other. And it brought with it something else, um, and that is a blossoming of different spokespeople for different regions and for different aspects, especially on social media, whether it be the FBP hashtag, which has really actually helped encourage a lot of other voices and a lot of other experts on social media, or um, our Facebook groups, or actually these, these regional events all around the country, the marches, the getting together, that helps train people up to speak to different communities, to target different angles, and that gives us collective richness. And that's what we need to encourage. But on top of that, there's a spirit that goes with all of this. There's a people can do spirit. There is a real community that we have built. A lot of the Lee vote was about reaction to powerlessness and lack of community around them. And the answer to that is not to tell people they're wrong and um, they don't realize the grand vision or they're irrelevant anyway. It's actually to build the kind of community that empowers them to make change over the world around them. And that is actually pragmatically what we're doing. We have visible community. We need to make sure that there's a welcoming community in terms of all the engagements we have with, with MPs or local institutions or out on the streets, a visible community, a welcoming community, an empowered community, because we are saying to people that they still hold the power. They can look at where this country is in the world right now. Um, they can gather up with their friends and put pressure on their local MP. They can take a view now as to whether they think Brexit's going well, and if it's not, like most people think it's not, they still have the control to do something about it through their local community, which is connected with other local communities, which is connected with a national campaign. This is grassroots in action. This is always, what was always missing. This is what we are actually taking active action about. And I think it's that combination of richness and community, which is the spirit that drives 
how all of our different campaigns should be working together. It takes time to come through, but I feel that we're really, really getting it there now. So more of the same, I say. Uh, well, thank you very much for all three of our speakers. Uh, as uh, Eloise has said, you know, I think it's amazing the lineup that we've got here for, from, for, for today's uh, conference. Um, and um, Professor Grayling was saying at the earlier session how one of the good things, uh, very few good things to come out of uh, Brexit was uh, awareness, for example, of this kind of sinister social media targeting that went, up, went on in the run-up to the uh, 2016 referendum. Well, one of the other good things is that it has started to create this grassroots movement that wasn't there before, and more political awareness, I think, than existed. Um, and, and increasingly so uh, among young people, which we really, really need in this country. I'm sure everyone agrees. Um, so now I would like to open up the uh, session to questions. Um, if you would like to put your hands up. Um, I know this gent because he's from North Yorkshire, but you're Scott. Uh, would you like to put your question? Thanks, thanks Richard. Yeah, just a quick, a quick one, really. Uh, one thing that struck me most powerfully today uh, was uh, Will Hutton's remark about there being 10 weeks left. And that theme has come out from various um, members of the panel uh, on, on timescales. Um, I understand and I fully appreciate and value the great wealth and disparity of, of the movements and the organic approach that our um, movements um, take, uh, grown from. But could, could the pal panel give their reflections on uh, how, how to balance the need to focus <coughs> activity when you have a very short and very defined time scale with those organic groups yeah I'll, I'll, I'll happily say that the focus needs to be on Parliament it needs to be on the MPs um, everything that happens will happen through Parliament we need to triangulate on those key MPs hard this is why it, it's not just what we do at the top media levels or, or not just the true judicial processes that matter but most importantly, when we do have the, the granularity and that local confidence, it must be the pressure on those MPs. And a lot of people bang on about why doesn't Jeremy Corbyn do more and, and so forth and so on. A lot comes down to plenty of MPs, Labour MPs, in particular this region of Northern England, who were being a little bit lazy and resistant. And I love the fact that now the north of England is much more anti-Brexit and pro-EU than the south of England. That has really swung round. It's, it's been real ownership, real ownership by Liverpool for Europe, Leeds for Europe, Manchester for Europe. You know, I, I really, really feel that um, up in the north of England. And, but you need to work hard on your MPs here um, because it's through them that actions get taken. It's through Parliament. We need laser-like uh, focus and pressure on those individuals. Um, I think this lady had her hand up before. Um, uh, in the front, yes. No, no mic, is there? No, you have to shout loud. Right, it's just your comment about Nigel Farage. Yes, I know he's got this uh, uh, conference or something on the 20th. Do you think he is a spent volcano or, is, or should we start to take... Because we never took him seriously before. Should we continue to take him seriously or not? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Well, I sit in the European Parliament with Nigel Farr. <laughs> when he's there, <laughs> for me. That is when, when you see him, because he, he turns up once a month to make a set-piece speech and goes. He was a... He, <laughs> more vodka, yeah. yeah. Um, he, he was a member of the Fisheries Committee when the Common Fishing Policy was being reformed, which was desperately needed. He turned up to one meeting out of 42. So he just uses it as a platform for the outside, doesn't do any serious internal work. But yes, he was a major force. I think he is partly discredited, but not entirely. There are still people who, who believe in people like him or Boris Johnson or others, and that's the people we need to work on. Um, the, the gentleman at the back uh, with the white hair, in, in the, the green shirt. Um, I've introduced a nice view of. Um, thank you all. I'd like a slight dissent from uh, the last question of our one and even from Will Hattingham. And I, I agree with Gus that it's likely that the next 10 weeks are going to be 
the most crucial. But I don't think we should tell our activists that it's 10 weeks or never. Because one point about this government is it doesn't have a strategy uh, in what it wants to do, it has a tactic. And that's to keep the can further and further down the road. And we don't want people to be popped off and told if we don't get a referendum uh, signed up for in the next 10 weeks, we lost. Because this thing would go down to the wire at the end of March. So we have to have the momentum and the stamina to, 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 to carry on. Um, uh, and, and we might find that this is a voting parliament in March, which, 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 which is a nice point. The next point about MPs, I, I again, I would like to say, MPs have a duty to their own uh, constituents. They can completely back off other people. MPs know that there are campaigns on both sides to send stereotypical letters and so on and so on, and they're shutting down to them. What we need and what we're setting up in the Northwest, and I hope it's happening here, is that we have active constituents, not letter like writing ones, not keyboard ones, people who would phone, demand to see the MP, you're my MP, I want to talk to you, I want to see you now. And when it gets to a point, especially for the Labour MPs, those people can, at the touch of a button, an email, actually demobilize and ban the doors of their MPs and say, I'm your constituent, I've come to another one and another one. This is how we want to devote, because it will be that crunch point in which we have to get the activists to mobilize and hit their MPs. Yeah. Like to come back on that. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a really important point. Um, it could go on, but I think we have to be ready in case that parliamentary kind of crisis or potential crisis happens before Christmas. And I think there is a big chance of that. We know that October's now probably shifted to November, December. We know they might use that European Council there. We know it might even bump to January, but there will be a collision of sorts and some kind of vote when it's decision time on passing or rejecting Theresa May's deal. And I think that to that point, and what all those activities you've described are absolutely the right ones. And what I would say also to Scott, who had the first question, you know, it's really, if anyone's remotely interested in stopping Brexit or concerned, get them to sign up to any of the campaigns that write to the MPs frequently. Um, secondly, talk to leavers or people that are unsure about letting them know that it's not a done deal yet. And also, if they're remotely interested, get them to sign up because we have ways of taking people on a bit of a journey to get them to a point where they might be um, interested in writing to MP about Brexit. But we can't be complacent. I think that's the main thing. So yes, we need to be ready for it to go on, but we have to be ready for it maybe to be November, December. And in the meantime, just get people signing up as, as often as you can. Uh, Mike just would like to say, uh, th thank you. Uh, Mike would just like to say a few words on that as well. Yep, I thought that was an excellent pair of questions. The first one, yes, we're not out until we're out, and people need to know that because it gives hope. But it is a race right now. We're, we're in a race to, to gather that momentum, and that's what we're focusing on. Um, as to the second point, you are absolutely right. Um, the most effective way um, is to invite your MP to your local business or to your local hospital. Gather groups of people that can talk about this business here um, or this um, initiative that was, was funded by the EU and where's the replacement or this hospital here where we have the following concerns or this charity here that is looking after patients with rare diseases. Invite your MP to come to you and meet a group of people that can talk about the concerns there. That impresses heavily upon their minds. Um, uh, the lady in blue over there. Hello. Could you introduce yourself please? Um, yes, I'm Jenny Scott from a village just outside Lincoln, so we've travelled quite a long way. Uh, it's a heavily Brexit area, and when you say that people don't realise that Brexit isn't a done deal, I just feel, I would say 85% of the village read the Daily Mail, or something. And the BBC, I have listened to it now for 70 years, and I have been horrified by the lack of questioning, challenging. Well, having 
worked for the BBC uh, a few years, you know, for, for some years. Uh, I, I share your total frustration and uh, find it very difficult to, to listen to their output. And, and I think it's, it's scandalous. And, and it, when we, if we can get out of this mess, I, I, I think there needs to be some sort of inquiry into the, uh, the media role in all this, including especially the BBC's. Uh, have we got time for other questions? Anyone who's got the... Uh, this, this gentleman in the red shirt is very keen to speak. Uh, Sorry, uh, I just felt like we were talking about MPs are important at the moment. In the political world, what's coming up now is the party conference season, not, not the parliamentary term. Uh, so in the, in, on the 23rd of September, Labour in Liverpool, and there's a march, you know, and Jeremy Corbyn is about listening to what's going on outside the, the meeting hall and what's all happening on the street. So I think it's very important the North makes a good turnout for Liverpool. Yes. <laughs> we get to Birmingham, the Tories of the week, week after, it's on a Sunday. But what, what I did want to say was, when you organise in your local area, so over the summer we got Best for Bolton organised and up and running in two weeks flat. Yes. And Farage is going to Bolton, yes. there is a Best for Bolton, it exists now, it did not three weeks ago. So you can do a lot of speed, but we've got to... I, the problem is that most of us live in constituencies where our MPs are already on board, and we've got to twin with areas where people are feeling a bit beleaguered, a bit lonely, and get our massive people in our area to where people need help, which might be North Yorkshire or elsewhere, but we've got to talk to each other and build that network. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Richard would just like to come back on that. Very quickly to say, any of you who are in Liverpool on the day of the Labour Party conference, or indeed Birmingham for the Tory Party conference, do indeed join the marches that are taking place. The Labour Movement for Europe, another niche organisation, <laughs> is, having, <laughs> is having a fringe meeting Monday lunchtime. Um, you've got to, some, some leaflets. Sir. That's what I'm saying. You have to come. Yeah. You have to come. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, so, uh, the lady at the back in blue. Can you, can you introduce yourself, please? I'm here with the In Limbo Project. My name is Cozy Jennifer Hill. I'm also very closely involved with the organisation of the march in Liverpool on the 23rd of September, so I hope to see you all there. And I'd like to connect to the previous session and what the lady in the blue T-shirt said about what's been happening in Chemnitz. It happens to be where my great-grandfather was born. And I also watched with interest, not just the fact that there were far-right marches, but much more importantly, that last Monday, with four days' notice, 70,000 people descended upon this city to say, this is not what we're about. We are not xenophobes. We are not racist. It was organized by a, a bunch of punk rockers and rappers and whatever that newfangled modern stuff is. <laughs> and, um, I, I'm familiar with the punk rock side. <laughs> so they managed to inspire 70,000 people to get in their cars, to get on their marching boots, to get down there and party and make a statement about what we are about and standing for basic common human decency. What's it going to take to get the British people on the streets? Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this gentleman here, uh, yes, who's saying yes. No, can you introduce yourself, please? I'm, I'm Tim Dalton. I'm, I'm local police, and I'm heavily involved in the um, sort of Leeds North East uh, Remain campaign um, you know, during the last referendum. Mm. And, uh, and, and I'm, um, I always want to sort of back up the point of the uh, gentleman over there with the white and, and my t-shirt and, um, and just raising one on that um, because the, the Labour Party's support for, um, for a unified support from the leadership for campaign reference is ultimately the prize. If that happens, the support Tory MPs who are on the fence will come because they know that they can actually make the difference rather than sacrificing their um, position within their party because their vote against, uh, against Brexit will make a difference it also breaks up some fractious problems within the Labour Party. I'm someone who believes in being on the front line of that within the Labour Party at the time, that Labour's um, conflict over Brexit in the last referendum, and to some extent the lack of support from some individuals in the referendum, potentially cost us the result. Yeah. 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 There is an issue of popularity. However, the Labour Party is 
fundamentally a majority Remain organisation, its supporters are fundamentally Remain organisation, it has the infrastructure and the membership, the people who are passionate and pro-European across the country to do what Mike was talking about and what we're talking about over there as well, we ship people from one constituency that's a Remain constituency and get them out campaigning on the other side of the country. The Labour Party can do that more than any other organisation in this country. So that has to be, that is the prize. If we can get Jeremy Corbyn standing up saying, enough is enough, let's fight Brexit together, then we can win. Uh, one more question from uh, the gentleman uh, with glasses. And, yes, you, sir. Yeah, uh, oh. No, sorry, it was the other gentleman behind. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, I do beg your pardon. Bit of pointing from Labour against Brexit. Uh, we also have a fringe meeting on the Saturday evening. Do come along to that if you are free. Um, I, the crucial point, when I've talked to Labour and the crucial point is that we have to get a vote through conference. Now, if you are a member of the Labour Party, make sure that your constituency supports a, a people's vote motion at conference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. about the others. If we get this through, then the, we will effectively mandate our MPs to swing in behind what we want. That's the crucial thing. That point is incredibly important. The yep. deadline for those motions is noon on the 13th of September next week. Check out, if you are a member of the Labour Party, check out your local CLP. Tap up your friends who care wherever they live in the country, if they're Labour Party members, and see if you can get some of those ones over the line. Yep. Do you want to say anything? Is this the last? Yeah, yes. Is there any, any more questions? No. That's right. Uh, just uh, ag agreeing with all that, just one completely different point since we're finishing, I gather. Don't forget to use humour as well when attacking the Brexiteers. One good one I've heard is, how many Brexit ministers does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> the answer is one, to promise a brighter future, and all the rest of them to screw it up. <laughs> I think that's probably it for now. So thank you. <laughs> you can't really top that one. Um, so uh, thank you to all our speakers and thank you for uh, taking part. Um, um, uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. I have. But I thought yeah. it, was, it was right for a moment. Yeah. 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 What I wanted to say. Yeah. Our brand is a good Labour brand meeting last week. Yeah. We had a discussion on oh, that's a good session, I thought. And um, what are you? Yeah, this is quite a good session. We avoid the legal people who were problems. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it would mobilise yeah. yeah. and give oxygen uh, to the far right. And I talk of people like Tommy Robinson coming right. into prominence yeah. and what have you. Uh, what was disappointing yeah. and surprising, yeah. it was the youngest yeah. member yeah. of the branch yeah. that actually did it. So really? I don't know whether you've encountered that argument. But somehow or other, you need to box that off. That is, I mean, it is a worry, um, but I think we have to let people know that people are shifting in this direction. We do have a majority to say in all that. Possibly we've got a break. Just be aware that that's got some currency. Yeah. Young, yeah. Young, yeah. Young, young couple yeah. who are involved in the union movement. Sorry. Yeah. They'll be usable on another occasion. Yeah. Good. No, that's good important. Point. Point. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, I mean, basically, he knows a lot of stuff and all the technical details, but emotionally, um, he can get really nasty. Um, but I've been out drinking with him, and you know, he just chatted non stop. He wanted to impress with his knowledge, you know, he wanted to, to share and sort of be involved, but at the same time, yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who, who wrote Flex It. So, um, no, just impressed upon me at the time that there were people that um, were for leave for their own reasons, but they still had cynicism and resentment about what the government were doing. Um,